you didn't um, get that email. Raise your hand if you are not getting my emails. Did you just recently um, register? Yes, I did. Okay, you'll get them, don't worry. Right. So, um, on, we've just decided to, as you can see, we're filming our class, and you'll be able to watch the video that we film each day here on our calendar. You just click here, and so here, if you happen to miss Tuesday's lecture, you will watch the video of it right here. And tomorrow, um, the video for this lecture will be up. So uh, it's great for you if you uh, miss a class or if you fall asleep during a class or if you happen to just want to review some difficult parts again, maybe your notes weren't that clear and want to hear the reasoning, you can click on the video and scroll to whatever part you missed. It's better for me too because I get to see, you know, I look it over too and see if I made any mistakes or see uh, what I taught uh, in a way that could be improved upon. So it's a great tool for me as well. So um, I hope you like it. And in, we're going to do this instead of posting the completed notes. So uh, students learn better from you get to see the lecture again. And you can uh, understand the reasoning and not just copy down the notes. Now, the other new feature is since this is a second semester course, it's a follow-up to STAT 100. A lot of you are rusty on STAT 100 material or maybe didn't take STAT 100. And um, if you want, so I just have some links to review material uh, that you can click on from STAT 100 for each part. So right now we're on type 1 and type 2 error significance test. So like, for example, here's a link to notes on significance test from STAT 100. All right. Basically, we are, this is going, these, these are just the completed notes, but if you want to see the whole course and look at the videos from STAT 100, well, that's posted here on our review materials. See, it says online background resources right here. So if you click here, you have all the filled in notes from step from spring 2013, I think, and all the recorded lectures. Um, and that's where that's where I'm linking to. So you can look at the lectures as well. All right, so that's a great resource for you. So that's basically it. And if the calendar changes at all, um, I'll update it on here. For example, right now we're supposed to finish part one. And I don't think we'll quite finish it. So there's a, you'll certainly be able to do this Monday homework one. But I might have to move this Wednesday homework one to Friday. And I'll let you know right away. I won't move anything earlier. I will never move due dates earlier. But I could possibly move them a little later. Okay? So check the calendar frequently. And I just want to remind you all that the very first thing that's due, it's everything that you turn in, is online capo. Everything is graded. That's we're not hand grading anything but the exams. So any surveys, any uh, homework, any assignments are all done on Lawn Kappa. And so everybody should try to get on Lawn Kappa. Now there's been a problem. Raise your hand if you're not able to get on Lawn Kappa. Okay. Um, send me an email or see me right after class and I'll get you on. Okay? Good. All right. So now, remember where we left off last time? We're going to we'll go to the document camera now. And we left off right here. We were on page six. And we were looking at how to calculate the type two error given um, that we know uh, basically our sample size and all the other information. So just to review, um, raise your hand if you weren't here last time. I'm just curious. Okay, just this will help everybody though. Just to where we're at, we're doing these significance tests, and um, all significance tests are done to see if uh, to check whether some effect we say see is real or just due to the luck of the draw. Okay, 
whether we have a real effect or something just due to the luck of the draw. And there's two types of errors that we can always make. One type of error called this type one error is if the null is true and nothing's going on and there's no effect, then we mistakenly we draw our cutoff line here and we say this is the null cutoff line and this is the probability of basically saying there's an effect when there really isn't one. A false alarm. Basically, it would be like a fire alarm going off and there's no fire, right? Okay, and then we're subject to another type of mistake. And that is, if there really is an effect, if there really is an effect, we run, we could make the error of not detecting it. Failing to detect it, an effect that really exists. And that would be equivalent to, um, there's a fire, there's a real effect, a fire, and the alarm doesn't go off. So both types of mistakes are ones that we want to reduce as much as possible. Okay? Now, that's the idea. And so let's review this example just to make sure everybody uh, remembers how to do this. And then we'll um, work on <coughs> how we can reduce uh, both types of errors. Okay, so this example concerned my granddaughter, who I think um, has some special talents. I, I, I called her my baby genius because I think that uh, even though she's one year old, one year old, she can answer these yes/no questions. She can understand what I'm saying. Okay, and um, my son, her father, thinks no, she's just you know, she's just guessing. So the idea was that we're going to do this significance test. And we assume the null is true that she's just guessing, right? And what we said, if she's just guessing, this would look like, you know, she'd get, we'd expect her to get 50% right, give or take 5%. That's the, sta the sampling error. The sampling error or the standard error of the percent under the null if she's just guessing. You could, this is equivalent to flipping a coin 100 times. You'd expect to get 50 heads half the time, but if you did it, of course, you're not always going to get 50 heads, right? There's a, there is a, I mean, theoretically, there's a chance you could, just by the luck of the draw, get all heads. It would be very, 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 very rare, but basically, uh, the, if, if we drew the probability histogram of that and um, smoothed it out a bit, it would look just like the normal curve here. And 50% would be in the middle, and this, and the normal curve in terms, you know, this this is, these are in terms of z-scores, in terms of percents, one standard error here that we figured out was equivalent to 5%. So, this is what, in terms of percentages, this is what it looks like. All right, and so now we say, okay, we're going to do this significance test. My son thinks the null hypothesis is true, that Talia will get, you know, yeah, she could get up, she could get higher and stuff, but it's just, this would, this is all due to the luck of the draw. And then we just, he, we decided to set the conventional cutoff. Like, at some point you have to say, okay, it's beyond a reasonable doubt. If she gets way up in this area, so way up here, then we're going to say, we'll agree to reject the null and conclude that she does have some special talent, okay? So, that's the idea. So we agreed on this 5% conventional cutoff, alpha equal to 5%, and then we figured out this z-score corresponding to a right-hand tail of 5%. And we did that by, how did we do this? We said, okay, if this is 5% of this tail, and it's 5% of the other tail, 90% in the middle. So we went to the back of the book, review just to make sure you got this down and we went to the back of the book and we got the we looked at the um, normal table here this just very simple normal table that just shows the percentage of the area between z and negative z so we look at we you can either either know z and you can look at the area or vice versa we're not really using this height column at all okay so um we know the middle area is 90, because we want 5% there. We're trying to figure out what Z cutoff we have. 
He said that's 1.65. That's how we got that. So I drew that in here. And now, um, so okay, 1.65. So I'm thinking, okay, if she does better than 1.65, then I'm going to win the bet. We have money right on, on this, actually. Okay, so I'm going to win the, the bet, and he's going to reject the null. He's going to think there is something special about her, okay? 1.65. So I think, hmm, well, how much, how much, what does that mean? How many does she have to get right? How does, how do you translate that 1.65 into a, um, the percentage that she gets right? And we saw here, because we already, we already did that calculation, basically we can see it, it's somewhere between 55 and 60. To figure it out exactly, we say, hmm, this, we start right here, our value here, this is our value or our score, is going to be the expected value, that's what EV stands for, that expected value, which we all know to be 50%, plus this 1.65 that says 1.65, not points, it's not 51.65, 1.65 standard errors. And since our standard error is 5, it's 1.65 times 5, which works out to 58.25. So that's where we're at right now. And I thought, oh, 58.25. That's, I think, I have to think about hmm, the alternative hypothesis. So when the alternative is true, well, I'm going to, there's a whole host of alternatives. I think you have to know something about the situation. You have an alternative that you think is her true ability in this case, which I think is about 60%, which is certainly not getting them all right, but I think it's better than chance. So if it's 60%, I think, wow, this is great. I'm going to win the bet. Because look, right, I'm beyond the cutoff, no problem. But then you have to realize that you have to set up another alternative, an alternative box. This was the null box, and this is the alternative box, and this is yeah, this, the idea is that if she's at about 60%, there's, there's going to be variation around that. It's like it's as if she's drawing from a box that has just tickets with one and zero, one indicating not yes or no, but correct, whether she's correct or not, whether she answered it correct. And I think, of course, you know, that this is her brain instead of this, right? And of course, her brain has random neurons, you know, there's random variation around this. I think she's understanding something, so it's around here. So then I have to figure out a new um, sampling distribution here under this alternative. So of course the expected value is 60%, that's what I expect, that's going to be dead center corresponding to a z-value of zero, but um, I have to figure out a new standard error. So the way that we, we're using the same exact formula, but the standard deviation of this box is not the same as the standard deviation of a 50-50 split. There's going to, right, there's a little bit more variable, uncertainty. Here you're a little more sure you're going to get a 1 rather than a 4, 40%, because 60% 1, so a little bit less variability. Take it to the extreme. If they're all 1s, there'd be no variability. You'd have a standard deviation of 0. So here, um, the way we figure out the standard deviation of, a, of just 1s and zeros is by, you've probably seen it in STAT 100, you've certainly seen the formula, I shortened it here, it's, you've seen 1 minus 0, standing for the numbers on the tickets, times the percent or fraction of the tickets that have a 1 on it, which is 0.6 times the fraction that have the 0, that's what we do. And since 1 minus 0 is just 1, we're not dealing with, you know, we're not giving your two points for a question or something. So that's what it is. Um, probably if you were an AP SAS or to, the standard way to, that you that this is uh, conventionally written is the square root of P times 1 minus P. Right? The probability of getting one number times the probability. So you've probably seen that as P times Q or P times 1 minus P. Same thing. Alright, so we do that. And it has to be less than 0.5, but it turns out to be less by just a smidgen. You can see this because this would be the square root of, if we did it the same way, the SD here would be the square root of 0.5 times 0.5, which is the square root of 0.25, which is 0.5, okay? So the only, here, in this one, we're just gonna get the square root, just a smidgen difference, the square root of 0.24, right? 
and that turns out to be 0.49 or very approximately and so when we you know basically we get the same standard error of five percent that's what we're putting here okay it's the same standard error so we can pretty much um it's the same standard deviation and of course since we're sampling a hundred tickets from here it's the same standard error and so there's our standard error i'll circle it and it was there it is here it's just a smidgen less less than five percent okay you got that understand all right so um and generally speaking you're going to have the same standard errors right we'd have to be have a very very different hypothesis we'd have to have something like a 90 percent 10 percent split if we had something like that 0.9 and 0.1 we'd get three percent okay and then for sure we'd have to generally speaking in all the problems that you see you're gonna you're gonna have pretty much the same standard deviations does that make sense all right certainly i mean when it comes up where an example where you have very very different standard deviations it comes up all the time you'll see it on the news i just saw something about it recently people uh commentators news commentators always point to how ridiculous uh, the statistics is and uh, polling is by saying, well, um, they say Kasich is, I just saw this one, uh, polling, he's got 1% of the population or something like that. One, he's got 1% favorability, give or take 3%. They said, wow, that takes him down to negative 2. Statistics is all messed up. We can't believe that stuff. Well, what they're not taking into account is that they have to recompute the standard deviation. They're basing that 3% on close to 50-50, which is how most, you know, mo most races are close to 50-50. Even if there's a 40-60% split, we still get this. But if we have a 1%, 99% split, we're going to have a much, much, much smaller standard deviation. So those error bars are not going to go negative. So they're, they, they don't take that into account. So I just want to let you know that there are, certainly are cases where you're going to really have to be careful about that. But generally speaking, what we're doing, the standard deviations are going to stay pretty much the same, which means we have the same shape to our sampling distribution. Okay? So we've got pretty much the same shape. So now, what do we do? So now, what we're saying is, okay, so we say this is 1.65 here. And we got 58.25 cutoff, right? And now we want to translate that on this new alternative hypothesis that has the same um, standard deviations. We want to translate that. Now, what do I mean by the same standard errors? Look, it looks kind of messed up. All right, so let's draw it carefully. What I said here, so this should be one, two, three, negative 1, negative 2, and negative 3. All right. Now, this lines up with 60. This, this negative 1 right here should be, this should be, boy, this is so hard to see. I'm really sorry. I think I have a better version of it. I'm going to pull out Carly's notes because how many people have had Carly last semester? She was um, sitting in on my class last semester and she just takes such beautiful notes that if you just want to look at this. Don't you just like everybody goes, oh it makes you smile. It's so beautiful Carly. Look. Okay so that's my goal to start writing that beautifully but when I when I mess it up too much, I'm going to pull out these little notes so we can see how pretty it is. Whoops! Now, one thing. All right, so let's just focus right here. And um, and what did we? So here you have the 58.25, right? And now we have the same exact standard errors. 
right? And so this 58.25 stays the same, right? But uh, the null change, this z score changes. It goes, here's, watch this, this is our z, 1.65. When we translate it into a score, it's 58.25. But now, under the alternative, of course it's still 58.25, but what's its z score now? And we get negative 0.35. We get it by our observed value minus our expected value over our standard error, right? Another way to look at it, hey, this is a really probably nice way to look, look at it for you guys. Think of it this way. See how 60%, that translates to 2, right here. So if we actually took this curve and put it up here, we'd have, I don't want to mess up her notes, I'm just going to draw it right up here. Imagine, imagine, I'm going to mess, we're just going to draw another little curve right up here. If we took this right up here, it would be very hard, it would be hard to pretend I did. So it looks like that, I'm just lifting this and superimposing it. You see that to this distance right here, this is our new zero, our new expected value, and the 58.25 is just a smidgen down, zero is negative, it's 2 minus 1.65. That's where that negative 0.35 comes from. And part of the reason these notes were messy is I tried to make them close so you could see that. Does that make sense? They're basically our alternative. Think about it this way. All right, just go back. Anything on this side of the null cutoff, and we're going to reject the null. So of course we're going to, you know, our alternative is going to be here somewhere. And if it was right here, right at the net null cutoff, we'd only have a 50-50 chance of detecting it. So we want it to be further out. We want to separate these. When these two curves overlap like this, that's all, that's all our possibility of error. We want to separate them out more. So if the alternative further it is out here, you know, if it was way out here, then we, we'd never, we, both errors would be almost nothing. Does that make sense? So, so basically, you think you're okay. Yeah, if she gets what we expect, she, you know, when the alternative is true, yeah, we'll reject it, but there's variability. And so this, right here, this is our type 2 error. So does everybody understand that? Those are a review from last time. Just out of curiosity, was it helpful to review like that? Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you just find it a waste of time. No, really, because I can just start right and go faster. Raise your hand if you prefer. I just jump right into the next lecture. Okay, so everybody likes it. That's right. Now, we just, so that was our, that's our type 2 error. We want to reduce that. That's pretty high, okay? And the, what's known as the power of the test is the power to detect the effects that's really there. So it's 100% minus that. And you can see it's, it's, um, this whole thing. This. this yeah. Okay, we're good. So now we're going to look, so this is, this is what I just did. I said look at the two graphs at the same time, but we did it right here, so we're good. And then um, I said, okay, how can we decrease that? We have 36.5%. That's pretty high. So even if Talia really is this baby genius, there's still a 36.5% chance that I'm going to lose the bet. Why is that a problem? Well, I put her through a hundred questions, and think about it in real life. If you're doing an experiment, you've spent a lot of money. These experiments are not easy to do. You spend a lot of time and energy, and you don't want to invest all that if there's a 36.5% chance that even if you're right, you're not going to be able to detect the effect, even if it's true. So in order to get funding for your experiment, well, in order you want to plan your experiment, and you have to convince the granting agency that you have a better chance than that to detect an effect that's really there. So they want you, the, the sort of conventional cutoff is 80% power, 5% type 1 error, and 80% power, which means 20% type 2 error. Okay? So you, this is in planning your experiment. All right, so how can we reduce that type 2 error to 
20% or less. Well, you might think, there's a number of possibilities, you might think we can just, um, what can we do? We can just change, look, we can just slide this, slide this, which is our, our um, alpha, our type 1 error, sorry, slide this, why don't we just slide it over? Here, this right here is our type 2 error. This right here is our type 1 error. So we want to make them both, let's, we wanted to keep this at 5%, let's say. We want to reduce this one. Well, can we really do that just by sliding this? No. If we slide this over to reduce the type 2 error, do you see how they're, then we're going to increase the type 1. So basically, that's the problem with this. So, um, so what happens is reducing type two error increases type one error, and vice versa. Does that make sense to everybody? Can you see that? Raise your hand if you can you see that. Do you have to explain that more? Not if you can see that. If you understand that. You don't understand it. Okay. So what I did was I just I did exactly that. I said, okay, let's slide that over. That's what I did on this picture. I slid it over, and certainly this type type two error did get smaller. Yay, I did that. But look what happened to my type one error. Now that means that when there's no effect, and she's just an ordinary, it's going to be like a huge amount of time we're going to think there is one. Okay? So it's when there's no fire, the fire alarm's going to go off. We don't want that. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So now let's go to the next possibility. The next possibility is to change our alternative hypothesis. Is to just spread, look, we set it right here. Well, why don't we just pick a bigger alternative hypothesis? We don't have any problem. Now we re reduce both errors. You see? So I just moved it over. Well, I just moved our alternative over. So, um, what's wrong with that? Well, the alternative hypothesis is something that has to be, that you think is likely to be true, right? You can't just arbitrarily set it. If I could, if I could move it over and say, oh, yeah. She gets it right 90% of the time. 99% of the time. One year old, she can't answer all the questions. Well, then I'd sit her right up here. I'd have her like hold her right here. And she'd be the one pointing to all the lecture and lecturing. And, and we could post this and this would be a YouTube sensation, the one year old teaching stats. What I'm saying is that you can't you can't pick an alternative that doesn't correspond to reality because you're trying to show an effect that's truly there, exists. So it has to be one that's likely to be true. Does that make sense to everybody? You can't just say, hey, yeah, let's set it. Of course, um, if you have, the idea is this. If there's a, when you, when you have an alternative that's very far from the null, that means that you believe there's a huge effect, a very big effect. And when there is a really big effect, it's pretty obvious to people. It would be like um, the drug cures everybody. You don't really need to do a significance test. These are effects that just are pretty clear. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's not really. Um, so um, we could say that um, we need to we need to pick an alternative hypothesis that's likely to be true. Right? So we can't just make it bigger arbitrarily. Do, do you get that? Can I move on to the next one? Okay. So now what else can we do? Well, what we'd like to do, there is a, there is, we're hypothesizing a 10% difference between 60% and 50%. What we'd like is to have more precision on that, to reduce these error bars. I guess this was our original. 
to make them much smaller, to separate out those two curves, right? To, to make the error bars narrower around that. So we want, you know, there certainly is this 10 percent big difference. We just want, we want to reduce our sampling error. And how do we reduce our sampling error? We can do that by increasing our sample size. So if we increase n, we reduce our error. The idea being this. For example, if you flip a coin, um, a few, uh, eight times or ten times, you can imagine getting a hundred, you know, you're going to have, you can, your error bars around 50% are going to be pretty big. But if you flip it a million times, they're going to be very small. You're going to get very close to 50%. The bigger your sample, whatever you take, if you take a bigger sample, isn't that, aren't you going to have less error? Right? The bigger your sample size, like there. If I just picked out three of you and asked, your opinion of this class, where, uh, you know, is that going to reflect the whole class as well as if I picked out 30 of you? No. The bigger your sample size, the less error, right? The more accuracy. So, um, more precision. So what, that's what we want to do. And so, we could increase our sample size. And that's what we do. We increase the sample size to, to reduce both, to reduce that error, to separate the two curves. So let's think about it. What happens to the standard error? Let's write our formula for the standard error, and you'll see it. Our standard error for these is, has been, for percent, we said it was the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. For average, it just looks like that. The key point being that the n is in the denominator times 100. This would be a decimal. That makes it a percent. All right? So look. If n is increased, you make that bigger, then the standard error goes down. Okay? So, the bigger the sample, the less the error. Okay? You got it? With a bigger sample, you'll be able to te detect smaller differences. If you sample the entire population, any difference will be significant. So the big, you know, the sorry. So that's what basic. So standard error did right down. So have more precision. This is error around our expected value. More precision means we have narrower curves. We have more precision. If we had tremendously more precision, they'd be completely 10% separated by 50 versus 60. Okay, now, so let's do that. Let's increase our sample size to 400, quadruple our sample size, and see if, um, see how much that type 2 error goes down and see how our power increases. So that's what we're going to do here. Any questions so far? Yes. Okay. Um, what you what she just asked was about when you increase n, that's your sample size, it decreases your standard error. Does that make is you're asking why? Yeah. Um well from the formula you can see since n's in the denominator, you can make this bigger, your standard error is smaller, right? The bigger right? If we, by a factor of square root of n, like if we increased our sa sample size by a factor of 4, we would have our standard error. Is that your question? Yeah. Okay. Well, you'll see it uh, when we actually do the problem. But we're going to work that through, okay? Mm -hmm. But intuitively, doesn't it make sense, like in an, um, that a sample size of 100 would give you more accuracy if you have her true ability than just, I and mean, if don't you get closer to 50% heads if you have to flip it more than if you just flip it four times? <laughs> if you flip it four times, what is it? You'd have a 25% getting 100 heads, getting all heads. 
You flip a coin four times, you wouldn't say, oh, it must be a fake coin, would you? If you got all heads? Because there's only four possibilities. You either get both heads, both tails, or 50% heads, or, you know, one head and one tail. So one quarter of the time, you're going to get all heads. You're going to get really far from 50%, you'll get 100% heads. Whereas if you did it 100 times, well, then you'd be very shocked if you got all heads, wouldn't you? So, bigger sample size, more accuracy, more precision. Okay, good. Now, let's, we're going to work out exactly that example now, though. So, what are we going to do here? Let's keep everything the same, exactly the same. We're just going to increase n to 400 questions. So, we're just going to make, we're doing the same exact example, but now n is 400 instead of 100. And that's the only thing we're going to change. Okay? What do I mean by that? I mean that we're going to still set our significance level at what? We'll still set alpha equal to 5%. 0.05, that's 5%. So that means we're still going to have 5% in this tail, still have 5% in that tail, right? That's where our null cutoff is going to be. That will be 90% in the middle. We'll look that up in the back of the book. We'll get our critical value of z at what? 1.65. We're still going to keep that the same. So here's about 1.65, and that's called our null, our critical value. The z we need to reject the null, so that's z at alpha equals 0 0.05, because if we chose a different cutoff, we'd get a different z, right? If it was only 1%, we'd have to look up 98% in the middle, we'd get a different z. Okay, and that we find to be 1.65. Between 1.65 and negative 1.65, right? negative 1.65, that's our 90% in terms of a z. Now, is our expected value still the same? If we sample from that same box that has 50% uh, 50 ones and 50% zeros, do we sp still expect 50% in the middle as our expected value? Don't we? She's just guessing. Isn't our expected value the same? The knowledge is just guessing, 50-50 chance, yes or no questions, right? Okay, so that is still the same. But now with 400, the thing that is going to change is our standard error for percent. Let's see how it changes. Let's write that formula again. Here's our formula. Our box, our null box is still that 0, 1 box, so this is still Standard deviation of 0 0.5, 50% square root of 0.5 times 0.5. But now, instead of the square root of 100, we're going to have the square root of 400. Maybe it will help if I just flip right back and show you that the only thing we're doing different here is changing that n from 100 to 400. When I do that, instead of having the square root of 100, which is 10, I'll have the square root of 400, which is 20. So instead of dividing by 10, I'm dividing by 20. So don't I get 5%? I mean, don't I get, I'm dividing by 20, then I get half of this, 2.5. Right? Correct? 5, 100 divided by 20 is 5. 5 times 0.5 is 2.5. Instead of 5%. Correct? Okay. And that's what I said. You quadruple your sample size. In your accuracy, your standard error goes down not by 4, but by a factor of square root of 4. That's the square root law. So, we go back. And we have here, it turns out to be 2. So basically, now we have an error of 2.5%. So instead of one standard 
error here, matching up with 55, like it did before, what do you think it's going to match up with? This is 2.5%. Now, one standard error is 2.5%. So instead of, remember our last one, look what's going on. Our last one had a 55 here. What do you think we're going to have instead? 52.5. So instead of making these, drawing these error bars really narrow, or it's easier for me to just change the scale. So instead of having one standard deviation being 5%, now we're going to have two standard deviations being 5%, right? So it will be, this will be 55, and 60 will go all the way out here. All right, so let's do that. So this is 55, 2 is 55, 3 is 57.5, and 60 would correspond with 4. So now look what happens. The alternative is now pushed way out here. Instead of being at 2, look what we did. So we've separated them. And of course, if we go the other direction, then this is going to be 47.5, negative 1, negative 2 will match up with 45, negative 3 will be 42.5 and negative 4 will be 40 in terms of these percents. You can put the percent in it. Okay. Any questions? All right. So now, what is our value? We want to get this value. Before it was, Talia had to do what, 58 point something? What was it? It was up here. It was, it was, she had 55. She had to get a 58.25. That was what 1.65 before, because our standard error was so much bigger, translated into, we multiplied by 5 here, 58.25. Now we're going to, it's not going to be so big. So, so now what we're saying is Z is going to be, well, first of all, we should get what that number is here. And what is that number? Right now, our Z score is 1.65. So 1.65. Now we're going to translate to a value. And our value is going to be what? 50 plus what? 1.65 times, what am I going to do this time? 2.5. So my value is going to be 54.125. There's the Z, is still 1.65. Now we, it's changed now. All she needs is the 54.125. All right, so what do I want to do? So the null says that our true ability is 60%, and now 60% is much further away, and we are going to have a much, much, this will be a much smaller error here, all right? Because this is going to be down to 55%, right? This will be down to 52.5 percent. So 54. This is my 54.15. The idea is this: this z-score is changing. So now, what is this as a z-score? That's what we have to figure out. We have negative one, negative two, negative three. It's between negative two and negative three. This is one, two, three. The idea is this: you start at a z-score. Maybe I should just draw this. We start at some z-score, z-alpha. And we set that, and we've been setting it to 1.65 because basically we started in alpha. You set that, and we've been setting at alpha at 5%, so that gets us to that. All right, now what we have to do from here is change it into a value. That's what we've been doing here, and we do that by the expected value plus, you know, 1.65 times that standard error the z times the standard error. Now this value is going to stay exactly the same. That value of 54.125 is exactly the same. We just want to change it to a z of beta. That's all we're going to do. So that's what we have to do now. Right? We're going to change that to a z of beta. So we're going to say the value, or the observed, we could treat it as like the observed value, or the value, minus the expected value, the new expected value under the alternative, 
over the standard error. So in this case, we get what? 50, we get our observed value of 54.125 minus 60 over 2.5. And that is negative 2.35. That is our z-score. So now our z-beta, we'll call it, we'll call it z-beta, is equal to negative 2.35. So the value is the same. We just have to, you know, to get from there to there. I'm taking you through this value that remains the same. And the reason I'm doing that is because the standard deviations could, could change. If they didn't change, like they haven't, you can see right away, it's a simpler way to do it, you can just pull this up. 60 goes with 4, and 4 minus 1.65 is 2.35. You just do the same thing. We're now this far over. Our alternative... Here's the difference between the z-scores on this one, see? It's just 4 minus 1.65 is negative 2.35. But this is a surefire way. Okay, so that's basically it. Now what do we do? Now, the idea is we're much further over there, and we have much smaller standard errors, and now we have this little thing right here. That's our beta. And how are we going to do that? You tell me. I want you to do something so that you... Um, so I know you're following. So what is that area? I know the z is negative 2.35, so what is that area? That's the beta that I have to get. So my beta is equal to what? Tell me what I should do. rounded to 98. Now, um, a little bit of warning on the homework. They might want more accuracy. They'll uh, I'll, because a computer is grading you and not a human, we have to program it to, uh, to allow a certain amount of tolerance. So it will tell you how many, did, how many decimal places you have to use, okay? So you have to pay attention to that. In class, we're just going to do it so we don't have to pull out our calculators. All right. So what she said was we've got this corresponds to 98% in the middle between negative 2.35 and 2.35. Do you see that? That's 98. So now we're just interested in that little bit, just one tail. The whole thing's 100, so it's 100 minus 98. That would give us 2% between the two tails, but we just want one of them. So that's a tiny, tiny, tiny beta. And of course, in our power is what? 100% minus 1% is 99%. Again, you have to be careful of whether I ask for beta in terms of a decimal or not, because often beta will, will not be given as a percent, so you'd have to write this is the same thing, this is equal to 0. And the convention usually is, well, it switches, so you'll just have to be very careful of what I ask for. I'll, I'll tell you. Mm. Okay. Yeah? Like, shouldn't the 98% be, like, all the way from 2.35, uh, all the way to the extreme left? Um, I'm just, we, the 98%? <coughs> yeah. Should be from here all the way up to there, you mean? No, no, I mean, like, all the way from 2.35 to the left. That so way? So whatever minus it is, minus infinity. Maybe you're used to reading a different table. It just it depends on which table you're reading. We're reading a table. We're using this table because I think it's a really gives you a very good feel for the normal curve. It's the same one we used in step 100. That gives you this. We should write here is the middle area. So when you look up, these are all middle areas. Boy, did I write that messy? Middle. So when we looked up 2.35, where is that 2.35? That, by definition, on this chart gives you that middle area. 
Yeah, you're sense. right that many, many, many tables give you all the way. Exactly. Very. Right. So be careful about that when you use this table. If you use something else, but this is the one you'll have on the exam. So you'll be given this one on the exam. Yeah. Um, so what does the 99% mean from the power? The 99% means on the power, let's look back to our, where we are. It's a good question. What it means is that if her true ability is really 60%, and I gave her 400 questions, which stress us both out. That's hard to do, increase that. But if you do this giant experiment, then you can detect, we'll have a 99% chance, let's look here, Imagine if this was superimposed. Um, we're going to reject here. So, as long as we get on this side, the null cutoff. So anything over here, which is 98 plus that one. See? So that's the way that what a power means is think of it this way: the word power. It's the power to detect a difference that really is there. Okay. Does that make sense? And the other is this, when it's really there, the probability of missing it. Now this is very highly powered. I mean, if you had, if you were, if you tried to submit your experience, you know, get funded for this, planning this experiment, people would say it's so expensive to do really big experiments like this, they'd say, wow, that's pretty overpowered. You don't really need that many subjects. You don't need that high power usually. But of course it depends on what you're trying to do. If making this mistake right here, you want it to be tiny, like you want to make sure that um, if the alternative is that some airplane part or something is broken and the plane's going to crash, you want it to be almost 100% of power. So it just depends on what the consequences of each type of error is. So that's really important to think about. I'm just talking about the convention which is set when you're designing an experiment, but if you're actually testing certain safety things, you're, and, and the alternative is if you're going to have some kind of accident, you certainly want it to be much, much higher. You want to really reduce that type 2 error. Like a fire alarm. If there's really a fire, do you want the fire alarm not to go off? There's smoke detector. Oh yeah, 20% of the time it just go off. Who cares? You know, it's not going to be like that. All right, so does that sound good? Do you understand? Yeah. So if the power is high, so is it better? Yes, power is good. I think that's easy to remember. Except really, power is sometimes bad. Power in the hands of a few is terrible, right? Corruption happens, but we're not talking about that kind of power. We're talking about the power of a statistical test. Yeah? Go ahead. How would you, like, how would you reduce the type 1 error? Very good question. That's easy to do. You just set that at the beginning. We set that ourselves at the start of the experiment. We just set that ourselves. And in some cases, absolutely, you would want to reduce that a whole lot. And we talked about cases like that, for example. That's, um, what is that? That's saying there's uh, basically a fire when there's not. That would be saying that's a false positive. So for example, if it was, um, you know, well, the example that I gave in your homework, I guess you haven't done it yet, is a good example of that. But let's say it, uh, you know, you get a false, well, let's say you get a false positive, like I got, this is from my own experience, um, false positive, saying the test has a lot of false positives, these mammograms do. And some of the other tests after that have a high false positive rate. And now they're discovering that, you know, all these women who are being diagnosed with breast cancer and all these people who think that, oh, I'm a survivor of breast cancer and go through all these treatment, these brave women, well, maybe they didn't have breast cancer at all because there's a lot of false positives. And some of those treatments are very, very horrible and invasive. I mean, going through chemo and that radiation that can cause 20 years down the line, that can cause more cancer, so you could end up dying. So if there's very invasive treatments, we don't want a lot of false positives. Does that make sense? So we'd want to make it less than that. Yeah? So in general, power, if you want to be high, you want your power In general, you want both. You want a really great detection system. Like our smoke detectors are pretty good. Fire alarms are pretty good. We want them. But the problem is that um, 
we usually, uh, that means getting a more precise, more precision, which is very expensive. You know, like a lot of data. Or else our detection system has to be improved somehow. We have to improve, certainly with the example I gave with mammograms, we have to improve that technology to separate out so it's so that our, it's it's a much better technology so we won't have as many of either type of error. Yeah. So when we uh, set that alpha level, is it if you say five percent alpha level, is it five percent of more details or is it just five percent total? Good question. He's talking about when we set five percent. Generally, I'm setting 5% in one tail, that's what I've been showing you, but actually most of the journals and most of the, um, you'll see always two-tail tests. In the software, you'll always see two-tail tests. So essentially, a two-tail test of 5% would mean 5%, what does that mean? It means, I don't know which direction. I, I would be, in this case, it would be saying, Talia is unusual. I don't know if she's baby genius or baby idiot. You know, she's just unusual. So I think she's either here or here. It's it's unusual. I mean, it, it's not a good example of that. But if I just thought that I could get it wildly here or right, right wildly here, that would mean on either. But I don't know which direction. I don't have enough information. I just don't think that she's guessing. I think she's either way up here or way up down there, then I'd want together 5% in the two tails together, which would mean 2.5% in each tail. So I'd have to look up 2.5% in each tail means 95% in the middle. So I'd look it up in the, in the back of the book, 95% in the middle, and it's right here, 94.88, 95.44, and it turns out to be 1.96, often rounded to 2. So generally speaking, people use z equals 1.96, or z equals 2, for an alpha equals 5% without really, even in examples where it doesn't really apply, just because the software does that. But I, I like you to think logically about it. I mean, it doesn't really matter. So if the software does that for you and, and, and gives you, um, you, you could just you could just say okay, well you could change it, you know. You could say I really want. Um, you could just either double your or have your uh, p value. They're doing it because they want to be conservative. They don't really trust people. They think they're going to fudge stuff, so they want to actually have you have. Uh, Lower significance, not 5%, but like really 2.5%. Are you worried about that? Does that help you? Does, did you have, did whoever asked that question, yeah. did, did you understand? Did that help answer your question? Like an example up there, would that be a two-tail test or one tail? This is a one-tail test because we are specific. I'm saying that I, my alternative is she's up here somewhere, and then I'm picking out an alternative up here. A two-tail test would mean. But I know that, you, you know, maybe if you know nothing about the situation and you sit, you're testing a new drug, you don't think it's going to be the same as the other drug, you think it's going to be different, but you don't know whether it's going to be better or worse. Like, let's say you already have a treatment for something, and now you have another treatment, well, you think it's going to be different, it's a different chemical, it's not going to be the same, and you don't know, you don't have enough information yet. You have less information. So this is, when you have a two-tailed test, you have a more stringent requirement, you need more evidence to reject the null because you have 2.5% here and 2.5% here, so you need a higher z-score. You need more evidence to reject the null. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yes? Yeah. I think we have the direct control of the type 1 error by um, increasing type 1 error while reducing or resulting in the reducing type 2 error. Is there like any situations where we'll intentionally increase the type 1 error to like increase our power? Okay, yes, of course. Good question. He said, is there any type of situation where you would where you, where you would pull this slider intentionally pull this slider intentionally over, have this huge type 1 error. Is this what you're asking? Yeah. Much bigger type 1 error to reduce this type 2 error. 
Yes, there are situations like that. They're generally situations where you have to say what the costs and benefits of each type of error are, often in types of, you know, like the example, um, what this means is, let's say, here's a very good example of it. Let's say you don't mind these false positives. Let's say it's a medical test for a disease where, okay, you get a false positive, you just get retested, or so there's no bad treatment for it. Maybe there's no treatment. There's, there's like a very, um, maybe the treatment for it is very mild. You absolutely want to get treated. So even if you take all these healthy people and treat them, but you don't want to ignore anybody who really has a disease because then they'll die. Okay? So let's say it was some kind of, let's say you had some disease where all you have to do is take a simple pill and you'd be cured. Well, then you'd want everybody. You don't care if everybody takes the pill, right? The type 1 error is saying you have the disease when you don't. The consequences of a false positive are not bad. Does that answer your question? It, I really want you to think about the situation. But the problem is that um, these conventions are set for a very particular situation of usually designing uh, these experiments and getting it published in a journal and getting funding for it. And that's where these conventions of the 5% and the 20% you'll see all over the place play out. Does that help? Okay. Any other questions? I'm glad you're asking all these questions. This is exactly what everybody should be thinking about. And, um, you know, lots of times both types of errors are horrible. And you just have to, and you really can't, you know, you just make these decisions knowing both. But the, the, and you just, you, know, you have to think about what's important to you and what's, and then you try to, uh, usually, if you have enough information about everything, you can, you can figure out which one's more important to you. Okay, let's see, where are we now? This is an example right now. It's very much like your homework, so I recommend that everybody, like, if you know it's late, and if you're like, thinking, oh, now's the time to take a nap, uh-uh, because you're going to be doing the homework this due Monday. It's almost a very, very similar to this problem. So let's walk through it. Okay, so um, a large class, let's pretend the situation exists, I'm sure some of you have been in this situation, they, at a, un at a university, uh, they claim that the average student, they're giving homework, that they say only takes the average student six hours a week to do. That's pretty a lot, but they, you know, you're, sp you, you're spending a lot more time on this. Um, and so are your friends. And so you want to convince the professor that, wait a minute, this isn't true. Because if you just went to him and said, hey, I'm spending ten hours on this stuff, how can you say, well, he could say, yeah, there's variation, and you might be, but the average student's spending six hours. And let's say it's a huge class with 2,000 students in it, and you don't have the resources to pull every single student in the class. That would be really hard to do. So instead you say, okay, I'm just going to take a random sample. Maybe I could get 16 students. So that's your N right there. You're taking a random sample of 16 out of the 2,000, and you want to dispute this claim. You want to say, okay, you want to see, you believe the true class average is much higher. To test this claim, you plan to randomly sample 16 students from the class of 2,000 and ask them how many hours they spend on their homework per week. Now the question is, how big would the sample average have to be to reject the null with the set significance level that most people accept of 5%, all right? So you go to all this trouble, you want to make sure you're going to be, you want to see how big is that going to be. So we formulate the null hypothesis. Now the null hypothesis is just, an, uh, you think there's an effect that you think that there's something unusual there. The null is just the ordinary dull hypothesis of no effect. It's just the claim of, in this case, just the professor's claim that the class average, the class average is equal to, what do you say, where is it? Six hours of how much time they spend. Okay? That's the claim. And so you say, okay, you take this null box, call it the null box, we model that as a probability, this, this translates exactly into a probability model. 
where we have 2,000 tickets in here. This is not N. This is our population size. 2,000 tickets. And on each ticket, if we had the opportunity to pull everyone, on each ticket, what the professor's claiming on each ticket, let's just model it. On each ticket is written a number equal to, what's the number going to be? The number of hours the students study, right? Each ticket is a number of, I'll just say, number of study hours. Ranging, right? And the average of all the tickets is going to be six hours, and there's going to be a range, standard deviation equal to four. It's not going to be normal because if you went down two hours, you'd have some students um, spending negative two, six minus eight would be negative two hours. Now, you can't spend negative hours on your homework. So it's a right skewed distribution. It's not normal inside this box, but the idea is that the probability distribution of the average, right, if we did this, if we drew, what, what do I mean by that? So you randomly draw n equal to 16, n is equal to 16, randomly drawn tickets. And you take these tickets out, 16 of them, right? And you compute that average, right? And the expected value of that average would be right here in the middle. Zero as a z-score, of course. But as an actual study hours, as your value or your number of study hours, it's not zero. We'd expect, we have an expected value of what? What would you expect the average to be? If the average of the box is six, of course you're going to expect it to be six. What else would you expect? Why would you expect higher or lower? Now, what is normally distributed is not what's inside here, but the sampling distribution of this average. We'd expect this, but every time we take 16 and compute an average, we're not going to get exact, it's a random draw, we're not going to get exactly six. The 16 tickets aren't going to exactly average out to six. Sometimes we're going to get higher, sometimes we're going to get lower. And so we need to figure out the standard error of this sampling distribution. And that is the standard error of the average, and it depends on two things. The standard deviation inside the box, the more variation there is inside the box, the bigger our error. If everybody studied exactly six hours, we'd always get six, and we'd have a standard deviation, standard error of zero. And the standard deviation is zero. Okay, and also depends on our sample size. The bigger our sample, the less fair sampling error there will be. If we just took a sample of one, then it would vary. That would be our standard deviation. It would be four. But in this case, we took n is equal to sixteen, so we have one hour. That is our standard deviation. Six hours is our expected value. Our standard error. You got it? Does that make sense? So, in terms of the normal curve, we have this, like we always do. And in terms of study hours, we have, I made this really easy, seven, eight, nine, one standard error of the average. A standard error of the average is exactly one hour. So, this is five, four, three. That's what it looks like. These are our hours. So now the question is, 5% cutoff, we don't have to go through that again. We know that's going to be a z, a z alpha equal to y. For a one-tailed test, it's going to be a z alpha equal to 1.6. We're going to change this up on the, in other examples, but for now, okay? And maybe on the homework, it might be, it might get something different. All right, so that is alpha equals 0.0. 1.65 for the one tail test. All right. As to answer his question, it was two. It would have been as if it was a two tail test. It would have been two, right? That's what we just went over. All right. So we've got that. Now, what do we want to do? Draw the normal curve into null. Translate that into an average value. Well, okay. Now we want the value. A value. So here, where's our? What's our value? This is our z score. Remember what we're doing. Going from here, and now we want to say our value 
is going to be what? Well, what's our value going to be? We start at the expected value, 6. I'm just translating it to the value of the study hours. To answer that question, and it's 6 plus 1.65 times what? Times your standard error. And the standard error is 1 here, so this is a really easy one. It's 7.65. So that's what's right here, 7.65. Okay? Does that look like? That's what that is. All right, you got that. Now, now, that answers his question. So you think, oh, if I get an average of over 7.65, great. I can show the professor he's wrong. He'll give us less homework. He'll accept that. Hold on there. Hold on there. That's, yeah, I mean, hold on. But what if, like, how likely, even if it really is 7.65 or higher, what do, you, what do you think it really is? What's your chance, if you go through with this with only 16 people, if it was exactly 7.65, there'd be a 50% chance that you're going to get below that and the professor's not going to change those rules. Because look where your sampling distribution. You just have a 50% shot. So you hope it's high. So you think, hmm. So you sample, your, you think about your friends, and you think, what's, what's likely? What's likely? And you say, you think, you believe the population average is really eight hours. That's what you truly believe. Now you want to see what the power of your test is. How likely would you be to fail to detect that difference under the null? What's your type 2 error, beta? If the true population, to figure that out, you can see right here, what are we going to do? We're going to translate that right here, that, into a z-score under beta. Under, not under beta, excuse me, under the alternative. So the alternate, this of course looks the same. And now, what's the ex formulate the alternative hop hypothesis in terms of a box model? So let's just go through this to get the reasoning. So this is what you believe the true class looks, the class really looks like. Yeah, there's 2,000 students in here, same class, but you think their average is what? Not six, but what do you think? Eight. And let's say, usually people stick with that same standard deviation. So in these problems, you can't figure out the standard deviation. You just have to know it, or you could estimate it from your sample, do a sample. But we'll just say, we'll stick with the same one of four, okay? So now, and we're going to do, so now we're going to be sampling 16 tickets. We believe we're sampling 16 tickets out of this box, right? So that means our expected value for the average is not going to be six anymore. What's it going to be? What do we expect? Eight. So we expect eight. Now, our standard deviation is the same, and our sample size is the same. So do you think we're still going to have the same standard error? Yes. Yes, you will. Because you have this, we're not changing anything. Keeping. And generally speaking, you are not, you're going to have the same standard deviation. So it's the same as. Okay, so now it looks like this. It's 8, 9, 10, 11, and this is 7, 6, and 5. So now what we want to do is we've done that. Now label the axis. We just did that. So this is the Z, and this is the hours. We just did that. And we want to translate this null cutoff, remember what we want to do, we want to go from the z alpha to our value to our z beta. Okay, so we want this value right here, that's going to be the same, that's 7.65, we want to change that into a new z score, right, basically it looks like this. It's still 7.65, it's still 7.65, that's going to be the same, but now it's on, what's that tail? That's all we're trying to figure out. Okay, so we do that the same way we always do. Our z is our observed value, we're treating this as the observed value, minus our expected value over our standard error, you know, it's this distance, 7.65 minus 8, it's negative. Negative what? Gosh, negative 
Thank you. Gosh. Here we go. Negative zero. And what's our standard error over here? Oh, it's just one. Cool. Hey, it's the same thing as before. Sorry. So this is the same z score. This is our z beta, as we got in our last example. I just made the numbers work out the same. Score. Okay, so that's negative, and that looks right. That is negative. This is z alpha, and this is z beta. See, they're opposite signs. If you think about it, 8 matches up with 2, it's the same. See, that's where we are. So it's really the same thing we had before between negative 3.5 and 3.5. That's going to be 27. Right? Isn't it the same problem as before? All I do is look up negative 3.5 in the book. Back to the book, and it's between negative 3.5 and 3.5. Do you understand? We've got that 27% in there. 100 is the whole curve. Minus 27. So our beta is equal to, this is how likely we want this. How likely are we? Even if this is the true average is 8, are we to not be able to convince the professor? Answer that it's 100 minus 27 over 2. 100 minus 27, 73 for both of them. 73 divided by 2. That's where that 36.5% comes in. And our power is just 100 minus that. So the numbers are the same. Sorry about that. 63.5%. In teaching, I did that because I wanted to match up these beautifully so you could see what's going on. Yeah. Can you um, tell me where the 27% comes from? It's I mean, I know it's from minus into two tails. So like, okay. Where did I get the 27? I knew because I did the previous problem. Pretend I didn't. What do I know? I know this z score. This one right here, I should have put a number here, is negative 1.35. Okay. You got that? Do you remember how I got that? I got that by um, this right here. I'm saying it's that far. It's 8. I'm, ta I'm taking the difference of these two things. I did it this way. Okay, you got that? Okay, so I did that. That's value minus average over standard deviation or value minus expected value over standard error. So we got that. Then here I would never know. Not work unless. I looked in the back here, and I look at 0 0.35. That's a z-score. So I go to 0 0.35, and that's where I got it from, and I'm rounding. So then I know that's my middle area. So I put it in the middle between this and 0 0.35. Does that help you? And that's where I got it from. Does that help? Okay. And I think this is a good place to end. You know what? You're not going to, this is like, we're going to go on, we're going to start this. I'll probably, will have to move the homework back a little bit for Wednesday. Monday homework, you're good for it. You absolutely do the homework. And don't forget, we have office hours today, 5 to 7, and Friday, 3 to 5, and all next week. Well, we've already started office hours, so if you can't get on, if you have any problems, please come to office hours in 23 Lionel Hall. 5 to 7 today, 3 to 5 tomorrow. And Monday, Monday is the day you really are probably going to be looking for help. That's 3 to 5 again. Okay, have a good weekend.